Okay, we're continuing our demonstration of the Men of Iron system. Now let's take a look down here at the Crusader army. This is the Battle of Haran. And it's an interesting battle. There's not a lot of special rules for this particular battle. And actually, from what I've seen, the battles i played so far, Dori Liam, Antioch, Ascalon, Haran, most of these don't have the overwhelming number of special rules for each battle that the battles of Men of Iron had. Men of Iron, there's there's almost an overwhelming number of special rules for each battle. It was almost like, it's like four separate games. And that made it kind of hard to transition from one battle to another. This one here, it's it seems much more fluid. There's not so much of that. And this battle in particular has very little in, in terms of special rules. Probably the only the only real important thing here is the, the Crusader army is actually divided into two armies but they collectively uh, will route as one. So you actually have two overall commanders, which is something of a weakness because if uh, either of them die, uh, it has an enormous impact on the outcome of the battle, uh, each one of them being worth uh, five route points. So uh, the fact that you have two of them just increases that particular vulnerability. Let's look at these two. I'm going to zoom my map out, and if you, if you have on your end... Uh, your map open, you can zoom it out a little bit to see the two formations. Uh, the boys in green off to the right, that's um, the army that's led by uh, Bohemond of Toronto, mostly Sicilian Normans, and it's a body of infantry, mixed infantry, with armored knights behind them. Again, this game system highlights the use of cavalry and their uh, supremacy at this particular point in history. Now, if you look at the uh, front line there of Bohemond's uh, formation, Bohemond's army is actually divided into two formations. Tancred of Toronto commands all of the infantry. So all the pikemen, crossbowmen, men-at-arms, and uh, archers are commanded by Tancred. The ratings on these guys are the same that you're going to encounter for the cavalry, but obviously the movement ratings are much lower. So you'll see that the pikemen, like this guy here, has an abbreviation PK which uh, means pike. He's got a movement rating of 4. Most of the ground boys uh, are slogging along at 4 movement points, and terrain has much greater effect on these guys. So there is a small rise in terrain here. These guys were positioned behind a hill, and these guys will have to pay an extra movement point to move up that hill, um, as with the cavalry. But that's, that's really the only uh, impact of terrain besides the stream. The infantry are actually impacted by the stream, but the cavalry aren't cost an extra movement point to cross the stream for the infantry. Now the pikemen have good, t um, I want to say troop quality, um, they have good shock die roll modifiers, but they have an uh, extraordinary weakness in that they're not very mobile and they possess no zone of control. I'll explain what that means in just a moment. Next guy off to the right here is the crossbowman. Uh, these guys have uh, archery skills, and they can be actually quite devastating. If you played Men of Iron, they possess the same devastation that you have in Men of Iron. Uh, it's just that you don't have nearly enough of them. So crossbowmen have missile capability, but typically they're very weak in shock. They cannot offensively shock attack. They only defend in shock, and again, low movement ratings. Uh, the men at, iron, uh, men, at, men, at iron, men at Arms... Same thing as you have in Men of Iron. Um, very, very good in shock, both offensively, defensively. Uh, cavalry frontally charging them will tend to balk at the charge. But once again, they have no zone of control. Archers don't have near the bite in this game that they had in Men of Iron. So if you played that system, they had a lot bigger bite in that particular game. Not so much so here, but they do have uh, archery skills, um, firepower, that's uh, something to be aware of. They have a zone of control, but uh, again, not very useful in shock at all. They're basically meat to be uh, chewed up by cavalry. Now let me talk a minute for about zone of con zones of control. Uh, each unit that ha is equipped with uh, missiles, namely crossbowmen and archers, have a zone of control that's only in the two frontal hexes. So these guys have a zone of control in their two frontal hexes, but not in their two flank or two rear hexes. So be aware of that, that archers, anyone that's equipped with missiles, crossbowmen or archers, have a zock. Cavalry also have a zock, whether they have missiles or not. 
So all of these guys be in the second line of Bohemond's cavalry. These are the knights, signified by the KN abbreviation. So these guys are the heavy hitters. They are the most powerful unit in the game. Their movement rating is not as fast as light cavalry, but they are extremely powerful in shot combat. They have, obviously, no missile capability. So that is the uh, right wing of the Crusader army. If we look over at the left wing of the Crusader army, there's actually a separate whole army here, and that is the army led by Baldwin II of Odessa. Now, King Baldwin here has... Um, two different formations. He's got the knights, which are in the back here, and then he's got the infantry up here in front, which is again a mixed body of men-at-arms, crossbowmen, archers, and mostly pikemen. So that is the situation here. And just for the sake of fun, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to rearrange the line because the player is given an open setup in this game and he doesn't have to have it positioned the way it is in Vassal. That might be a smart way to do it, but I'm actually going to put the knights up in front because that'll um, they'll get to the point of contact a lot quicker that way. All right, does anybody have any questions about the unit so far? This is real simple stuff so far. If you do have any questions, just feel free to type them into the chat bar on Vassal, and I'll try to get to it. Uh, the scenario book will tell you which particular army gets the first for uh, activation or whether or not you dice for it. Sometimes you'll have to roll a die and the high die roller will be uh, given the opportunity to go first. In this particular scenario, the Crusader army is uh, going to be on the defensive and the uh, Turkoman, uh, the Seljuk Turks, excuse me, army is going to get to go first. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to activate the obvious army to do for, or obvious formation, and that's going to be Sokman of Aleppo's formation. Now, when a formation is permitted to activate, every single unit within that leader's command radius is allowed to activate. So if you've played simple GBOH, this is a familiar system. So this guy's got a radius of seven hexes, and I don't see any... Uh, doesn't have the feature in Vassal to highlight a, a radius around him, but uh, he's got a 7 hex radius. Now, in addition to being able to activate units within 7 hexes, any unit that is within 7 hexes can extend his command radius provided that it's adjacent to another unit. So let's say for a moment that this guy here, let's put him 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Okay, this guy here is 7 hexes away from the leader. Let's zoom out a little bit here. He's seven hexes away from uh, Sukman himself, and so he's in command. But because he's in command, he imparts that command along to anybody adjacent to him. So now this guy here is in command, even though he's eight hexes from Sukman. And then this guy could be placed in command, and so forth. So you can actually string your command uh, a lot further than... Uh, the uh, actual printed movement radius on that particular leader simply by having your guys adjacent. So keeping your army together, there is something to be said for doing that. Now the sequence of play is very, very simple, and yet there's a lot of subtlety here. You actually activate the formation, you move everybody, uh, anybody equipped with archery skill uh, ability can actually fire their missiles during the course of their move. If you're uh, the active unit, you can only uh, missile fire once as an active unit. You can fire reactively any number of times that the occasion uh, arises. So you activate all your guys, you move all your guys, um, you shoot as you move, and then when everything's done, when you've done all your movement, then you engage in any shot combat if allowed or the situation uh, permits. And once that's done, then the active, the active leader can attempt, it is voluntary, but he can attempt to try what's called continuation. And what he does is he selects another leader from his, from his force. Now, not the leader that activates. So let's say I activate Sokman here, and I activate this whole formation, and I move them around, I do stuff with them. Okay, they're done. If I want to do continuation, I'm going to have to select one of my other two leaders, like uh, Jerk of a of uh, Mosul or this guy from Haran. Now if I select one of these guys, I have to dice on a 10-sided die less than or equal to their activation rating. So for this guy from Haran, I'd have to roll a 4 or less in order to, to successfully continue the activation. 
So give me a second here. I've got to save the recording and continue in just a sec.